Chernobyl is a very interesting and mysterious place. And with mystery, there's a lot of things people get wrong about Chernobyl and, subsequently, the Stalker games as a result. Like, Call of Duty with the famous All Gillied Up mission. That took place in 1996, and you can get to see the now famous and iconic Bazin Lazurni in full decay, but this is what it actually looked like in 1996. Huh? Well, that's how narratives work. Introduce something to people with a good story, and they'll believe that how they were introduced to that something is the OG, but yeah, contrary to popular belief, Chernobyl wasn't fully abandoned. It was evacuated, but a lot of people still worked there to clean up uh, for more than a decade after the disaster. That's how all the scientists managed to build those underground labs in the Stalker universe. It's almost like the post-Soviet spaces Area 51 if you want to draw a parallel. Yeah. There's heavily misguided presuppositions about the zone, and I must say, they're mostly harmless, but still open the door for curiosity and learning. But there's one misconception that really needs to go away, and that's that the famous video game series that takes place in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, Stalker, is a Russian game. And despite some very significant events that have been unfolding for the last decade, people still call, hopefully innocently, the Stalker games Russian Fallout, for example. And I just need to say something about it. And you might ask, CGR, what do you care so much as to make this video? Are you even Ukrainian? Well, not really. I have very distant Eastern European and Ashkenazi Jewish roots, but like I said, they're quite distant. I guess I just feel like I have to make this video because it simply matters to me. And my ADHD won't just let me shut up. I can't shut up. I, it's something I cannot do. So, let's get started with why. Why have people often confused Stalker as Russian Fallout? This is a great question for anyone to ask, really, because 10 years ago exactly, you'd be forgiven for confusing Ukrainians with Russians and hopefully just get on with a friendly clarification after learning something new. And I'm gonna seriously oversimplify the history because we're here to talk about video games. When the Soviet Union collapsed, most republics that declared independence basically did so because they thought they were better off running their own countries without having to deal with Moscow. Not necessarily on bad terms, but Ukraine, for example, was like, Yo, Russia, we think we got this. You gave us Holodomor and the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. You've been trying to substitute our language with yours for almost a century. and You can't deal with your own problems, let alone ours. Stay in touch, but we're moving on. And slowly but surely, Ukraine developed their own identity that had been under the shadow of the fraternal responsibilities of Soviet identity. Ukrainians even flirted with the more inclusive European sphere while staying in touch with Russia, yeah, and a fella named Zelensky thought you could have both, but clearly, uh, the interest for forming part of the European project is where Russia had a little bit of a problem. It's almost as if Russia, after having failed their own European experiment, wasn't cool with this. Because if Ukraine wasn't going to be a little Russia, it was going to be a pretty significant player in the European sphere long term. And Ukraine's success in Europe would seriously disturb the power structures in Russia. So they did everything they could to one-up or overshadow Ukraine. Even with petty shit, like if Ukraine hosts the European Championship, Russia must then host the World Cup, stuff like that but also with serious issues like poisoning a presidential candidate you don't like, allegedly, and intervening later on with Ukraine's application to join the EU. Which brings us to the point beyond which confusing Ukrainians and Russians was no longer okay. That started in Euromaidan in 2013, not on February 24th when the bombs started landing in Kyiv. What the latter did was mark the start of anything unapologetically Russian being indubitably unwelcome. Back to Euromaidan. Ukrainians basically stomped their foot and said, Russia, just leave us alone. We're not friends anymore. Joining the EU was a massive aspiration for people who grew up without the Soviet Union. They had no nostalgia for it and no Soviet hangover to stop their European dream, and it was snatched away from them. Since then, Russia has stolen land from Ukraine, fueled a separatist movement, started a war, and eventually invaded Ukraine themselves. They have progressively escalated the tension and conflict because Ukrainians only have one thing to tell the government of Russia. 
This isn't about what the West is doing in Ukraine. It's about what Russia doesn't want Ukraine to do with the West. Now let's talk about video games. The Stalker 1 trilogy, that's what I'm gonna call it. You'd be naive to think that these are just games and there's no underlying commentary about Ukraine's culture and complex struggles as a post-Soviet society, and oddly enough, some very grim foreshadowing. Old Mario Vargas Llosa said it. Creators will always subconsciously tell, tell us what they know, what they think, how they feel reflected in their work. I'm making it sound like I'm best buddies with Mario, but like, I, I just dig that one book. What do you want anyway? I want you to get out of the fucking way. But if we look at the zone in Stalker, to me, it's quite evidently turning the commentary of Roadside Picnic on its head. You see, Roadside Picnic is the original story of which Stalker eventually came from. It's a Soviet book about trespassers called Stalkers who illegally enter containment zones in which alien objects with unreal traits have landed. These artifacts actually represent temptations and traps that come from Western countries. Look, the main character's name is Red. I, I won't spoil it, but there's a lot of Leninist symbolism here, and it's arguably Soviet propaganda, or at least been diluted by propaganda. So yeah, read Roadside Picnic at your own peril. But speaking of spoilers, uh, soft spoiler warning for the video games. I'm mostly going to talk about the factions here, but the game is based on the Chernobyl exclusion zone filled with factions competing with each other and dealing with what to do with the damn thing. A lot like Ukraine itself in the 90s and 2000s with their post-Soviet hangover. You've got the government, who are putting together the pieces of whatever they can to control the situation however they can, and then figure out what to do with it later. But they struggle with corruption and underground institutions ruled by money. Come up and we'll have a chat. If not, I suggest you take off before we get angry. To me, this is pretty obviously the representation of the military faction in the video game. And you can sort of see as the games evolve and mature, how sentiment towards the military evolve as sentiment towards the government evolves. And the helicopter simply crashed because there was nobody there to fly it. The onboard computer was a little luckier. I wonder if there's anything useful here. Of course, there's the ordinary Ukrainian people living in Ukraine who are just looking for ways to get by, hopefully make some money, make a name for themselves with whatever projects they have. But that's a little bit hard to do with how the government is running things depending on the time and getting in your way. It's really interesting when the military seems to be on top of things in Call of Pripyat, you can see stalkers thriving in the zone, but not so much in the other two games. And I can clearly see how the Ukrainian people represent are represented by loners in the stalker universe. But wait, because there's more. You see, this developing democracy called Ukraine has now seen a boom in political ideology about how to run the country. You have the Ukrainian left wing, who aren't really like the Western left wing, they're more... They trace their roots to anarchists in Esperanto clubs during, uh, during the Cold War, and you know Esperanto, that language of the future, a hippie thing that never was, represented by a green flag. Well, those people at the time of development more or less seemed to line up with going with the flow. They didn't care about the neo-Soviets, they didn't care about the nationalists, they just took a look at what the Europeans were doing, they're, they're just gonna deal with what's going on in Ukraine. With or without foreign influence, they didn't really care. As long as it was Ukrainians creating their own future. But notice how I mentioned the nationalists a little bit earlier and the neo-Soviets? Well, let's get into the nationalists. Of course, they traced their ideological roots to the Ukrainian insurgent army, who basically hated everything Soviet and loved everything the Soviets hated to some degree. It's where you hear about this Bandera guy who the Russians really, really hate. The insurgent flag of Ukraine is red and black, representing blood and soil. This is the fundamental nationalist ideal. If it's not Ukrainian, it doesn't belong in Ukraine. And if you're thinking that these two are freedom and duty, the anarchists and the nationalists, well, you're thinking what I'm thinking. Duty and freedom quarrel with each other over what to do with the zone, and perhaps its anomalous nature is not too different from roadside picnics. The wonders of the zone represent foreign influences. Not only that, but we can identify political movements in the present that connect with these two. It's like the democratic acts to more or less match freedom, they're really intertwined, and a movement like Azov to more or less match duty. Of course, these aren't exact matches because 
politics are very much on a spectrum. This is Ukrainian politics after all. It's not exactly one or the other, but you can definitely start to see Ukrainian society taking its shape in the zone of stalker. Because where else to draw inspiration for your game than from reality? Of course, you've got bandits who seem to represent corruption, theft, crime, overall scum of the earth. Which is pretty straightforward, especially considering that bandits mainly target loners, the ordinary Ukrainians. Clear Sky is a special one because they had been destroyed while trying to get a grip on the zone and take control of it somehow after carefully studying it. I see a lot of similarities with them and Viktor Yushchenko's orange party called Our Ukraine, which featured a rising sun as a clear sky in its symbol. You know, not too different from Clear Sky. I can definitely see how Clear Sky could be analogous to Yushchenko's political fate, but really that's just as best an educated guess I can make as to what Clear Sky represents. But it's all really fascinating how I can see the social fabric of Ukraine being beautifully painted into this video game, and the relations, focus, interests of these factions to a degree make sense in their own ways within the game world itself. Just like you can study and understand the motivations of their real world, or mostly real world equivalents. Of course, the context is different today. A lot of these factions have come together to fight a common enemy. An enemy that doesn't care whether a stalker is military, a loner, duty, freedom, a mercenary, bandit, clear sky, it doesn't matter. The monolith does not care. They're blinded by fanaticism given by the wish granter in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Which is nuclear disaster was Moscow's last gift to Ukraine before the Soviet Union's collapse. The wish granter, of course, is a trap. It it doesn't really grant wishes, it just steals your consciousness and uses you to achieve its own goal. Of course, if you take into account that people in Ukraine who sympathize with Russia are known as Malorus, Monalit, Malorus... Oh boy, maybe I'm seeing things, but maybe you are too. There's not really a lot of love by the Malorus toward people who believe in a free Ukraine. But the Monolith is a strange faction because they're basically zombies. Uh, who couldn't handle weapons. They'll endlessly charge you and run into your bullets, all in an effort to stop you from achieving your goal. And they're pretty ruthless. Sometimes the body stacks so high that you have to chuck a few grenades to blow them out of the way so you can see the ones that are advancing. And the scary part is that, in almost the exact same words, we've heard Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines of Bakhmut say the exact same thing about Russian soldiers and LNR and DNR conscripts. They're just cannon fodder. They are being sent to die in countless numbers, which is really grim. How a Russian soldier's life seems to be just as meaningless to its government as the monolith soldier are to the monolith. And the promise that Russia grants wishes to those who choose secession ended up being a death trap. Ring around the rosy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Eat it. Eat it. Monolith. Who's your monolith now? Suck my monolith. That's right, the monolith itself seems to represent Russia, and the monolith soldiers are people who act to unify Russia and Ukraine. There's more to the monolith in stalker lore, but that's a hard spoiler that I don't want to touch, so you can discover them on your own. I don't want to spoil the game for you even this many years later. But you can still connect more parallels with reality the deeper you go. I might be looking too much into it, but a quick search of Sergei Grigorovich's social media posts and the actions and statements of GSE Gameworld and their developers. I don't think any of this is coincidental. Yeah, okay. He's deep. But then why are the original games mainly exported in the Russian language? Well, now that one I think we can use Occam's razor to answer. Back when the games were made, the conditions for today's conflict had not been set. Only the culture had. The teaching of the Russian language in schools wasn't a political issue in most post-Soviet states, including Ukraine, so most people speak it, as well as in all the other post-Soviet states where it's taught. And that does include Russia, to which GSC was targeting a lot of their marketing, because after all, in 2007, the average Ukrainian and the average Russian were going through loosely similar circumstances. Eastern European games were a little segregated at that time in Western markets, so with the conditions being different now, those games were in Russian for the exact same reason that the Come To Me trailer from December 2022 was in English. Export. The conditions during the Soviet hangover were different than what they are now. The Russian language at that time wasn't evidently being used as a tool to divide Ukrainians. And Ukrainians themselves had bigger things to worry about, like the growing pains of a free market democratic state after decades of authoritarian rule. 
In the big picture, that's not too different from what my country went through in the 60s. It plunged into a democracy after 30 years of dictatorship, old structures refused to accept change and forced a civil war. And if it weren't for a US intervention, that civil war would have possibly gone on. And no, the result wasn't like one that made people happy, but I think it was better than war. I studied that war for my thesis and it really helps me appreciate the very delicate stages in a country's maturity. That's exactly what Ukraine went through in the 90s and 2000s. It's almost as if Ukrainians were figuratively bullied into being shy about their identity when it came to having a national identity. When it came to export, their TV shows would be in Russian, so would their video games, like Stalker. And, well, you know damn well, this is no small issue. This, is, this isn't even politics. This is a massive war, and if you get to call it politics, you're in a very comfortable seat as a spectator. But now I see Ukrainians are proud to label their creations made in Ukraine. They don't hold a second thought about their identity as a nation anymore. And the language in which the instructions of the bombs landing in their homes is being phased out of their society. And yeah, it's nothing against the Russian language itself. It's just that it invokes a lot of trauma. A lot of people in Ukraine speak mostly Russian, yes. But that doesn't mean that the language doesn't invoke a lot of trauma from geopolitical bullying in a way. Pretty much every Ukrainian, probably for the first time in their history, is unfathomably proud of being Ukrainian in a good way. We have no need to spell the names of Ukrainian cities in the Russian pronunciations anymore. That's another Soviet hangover that has died. That's why we say Kiev, Kharkiv, and why we spell Chernobyl with an O. That's why Stalker 2 will not be in Russian. This isn't the in or woke thing to do, nor is it Western propaganda. Your domestic issues have nothing to do with what Ukrainians want, unless that thing they want is support. It's just what makes sense. That's all I've got. Slav Ukraine. One last thing. I woke up to a surprising notification this morning. Over 100 of you guys have joined in on the fun, and uh, how can something like that not make my day? So, welcome. We are going to have a lot of fun getting excited for Stonker 2 together, so stay tuned. I'll be seeing you.